in your line of work or in your travels, do you like get a front row seat to both kind of doctors, those who are out to make a quick buck of a patient, see them as a dollar sign and those who are actually genuinely, you know, want to help the patient? Unfortunately, I have to say I see this or I hear examples of this every single day. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Welcome to the Mo Show podcast, episode 29, repping the Mo Show merchandise for the first time. My guest tonight is an assistant professor and former chairman of the OBGYN department at the University of Jeddah here in Saudi Arabia. Today, he heads the OBGYN department at the Saudi German Hospital, also in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, a consultant for the market leading Al Nahdi Pharmacy. His clinical practices include ultrasound in both pregnant and non pregnant women, also specializes in minimally invasive surgery as well as cosmetic gynecology. He's also a certified expert in the ketogenic diet. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Tariq Arab. Welcome, doctor. Thank you very much. Took a minute to get through that. How are you doing, Doc? I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm well. Thank you so much for making time for the show. No, my pleasure. I typically open the podcast with asking people how did they handle corona over the last year and a half, but it's become so mundane, and we'll probably get into that later in the episode. Sure. So uh, I will go another route and, uh, and ask you quite an open-ended question that I think a lot of people would like to hear the answer to, uh, which is what's the most misunderstood thing about health in general? Okay, well, you've got multiple things that are misunderstood, but I would drill that down to three specific um, factors. Number one, the fact that someone else is responsible for your health. Now, this is not the same as me blaming anybody for their health problems, because some people would interpret that as me saying, oh, you're, you're saying people are feckless or irresponsible. No, no. But you are responsible for your health. Now, obviously, whether you are empowered to address your health or whether you're in an environment where um, your health is impaired or your efforts to facilitate your health are impaired is a different and separate issue completely. And I think people need to be clear that that is what I mean when I say that. Um, People need to understand that health is a goal and it is also a destination. You will be getting older. You will be uh, subjected to uh, the stresses of everyday life. depending where you are in the world, changes in environment, exposure to toxins, exposure to um, viruses and other infectious particles. So the issue is that you should look at health as a continuous project where you're continuously refining what you're doing, changing your goals, meeting your goals, not meeting your goals, and attempting to um, blaze a path that is self-sustaining, but which also gives you the results that you want. Most important thing people need to realize, though, is that um, you cannot judge health by appearance. Okay, and I'll give you a typical example of this. Um, A major health epidemic in the world now is type 2 diabetes. If you look at um, type 2 diabetics in many Western countries, 55% of them are morbidly obese. So some would derive the idea that, oh, you look at an obese patient or person, I can judge that they're in bad health. But that isn't the case. Because in other parts of the world, for example, the Far East, the majority of the diabetics are not fat. They are thin. And if you were going to judge by appearance, you would assume that they were healthy. The reality is you can have very thin people who are incredibly unhealthy, metabolically speaking. What that means is if we measure certain uh, parameters in the blood, their blood sugar, if we measure their blood pressure, if we measure their insulin levels, if we measure their inflammatory markers, we might find that they are vastly exceeding what would be considered normal. Mm -hmm. Some obese people, yes, they, you know, being obese by itself is not a marker of health, but their health markers are pristine otherwise. So people need to understand that um, health is, you know, both under the, the bonnet, if we're going to use a car metaphor, but it's also external too. But you cannot break it down into one versus the other. They have to go together. Mm-hmm. And very often, if you are attempting to make changes to your health, you will see the changes um, below the hood, sometimes a long time before you'll see them outside. So if, say, you were morbidly obese and, high, and you've got high blood pressure and you've got blood sugar issues, you may spend months or even a year fixing the issues that nobody else can see, and you might still appear obese from the outside. So to you, I failed, you know, I, I haven't got healthier. No, you have got healthier because you've addressed the things that are going to stop what is on the outside changing. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
in the, you know in the absence of 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 any change internally. So yeah. that is what people need to understand. It's a journey. It's crazy. It's often misconstrued. You know, the 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 overweight people have problems. Thin people are healthy, and now you're saying it's reciprocal. You know, the the, the heavy could uh, be healthier than than those who appear to be in shape. Exactly. Um, that's wow. That's um, that's news to me. You know. Um, there you go. Ten seconds in, and I learned my first thing. Um, Doc, I would imagine that in the medical industry, it's constantly changing. It's constantly evolving. Uh, is it hard for you to keep up with uh, the tech that comes into medicine and how that unfolds in your line of work? Well. While it's true that we live in a time of uh, an explosion in terms of um, medical information, in terms of options, management options, whether we're talking drugs, whether we're talking um, surgical intervention, whether we're talking the advent of technology into the workplace, the reality is that there is a lot of noise in medicine that is not always driven uh, with patients in mind. Remember, there is a lot of um, interference in the delivery of, of medical care. Um, you've got industry funding, you've got interests of industry, sometimes intersecting with patients, sometimes not intersecting. And, and why I'm going into that is because the reality is 90% of the published papers, now published papers are the way that doctors keep up with the field, um, are not particularly useful for clinical care. And the challenge we have is identifying the 10% that will either change practice or add to our knowledge. Um, and that is often the issue because to, to perform medical research requires funding, requires patronage. Very often, people are interested in the end goal result. If you're going to fund the study, can we make money out of it? Can we get a drug out of it? Can we get a surgical treatment out of it? Can we save money? And that often prevents very good... Um, very good studies being done, and that often prevents um, meaningful changes or meaningful um, advances being made. Now, if you're talking about technology, no, it's very easy to keep up with technology. You simply put on the television or dive into the medical journals and just look at all the adverts for um, you know, various uh, interventional um, machines, um, Da Vinci surgical robots, for example. Um, you can go on YouTube, you can see all the you know, very expensive, uh, beautiful videos that are being produced that are advertising new technology. And it's always very um, seductive to think, oh, if something is new, it must necessarily be better. But that is where you have the interplay, and, and, and that is why it can sometimes be frustrating for patients that, you know what, you know, I, I went to a hospital abroad, I saw this amazing monitor, and, you know, they operated on me, I was out in half an hour, why don't you guys have that here now? And, and often you need to explain to patients that uh, in certain jurisdictions, um, there is more access to technology, but not because that technology has been proved itself to be better, but because there is more support in terms of industry wanting to push their products, sometimes some doctors... Uh, confuse self-interest with the interest of the patient. Um, sometimes they are involved in trials, looking at the application or, or distribution of bringing those uh, those new um, technological means to market, etc. So, you know, it th there is a lot of noise yeah, there, yeah. Um, and and it's true. It is sometimes difficult to keep up, but only because there is so much noise. That is why you're getting. Um, you know, increasing siloization of medicine, subspecialties, sub 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 specialties, even. Um, the question is whether all of that is necessarily beneficial to patients is something that in some fields hasn't been demonstrated. In others, you know, counterintuitively it is, mm. um, but it has also been demonstrated. So, you know, it, it keeps things interesting because if you don't keep up, you're going to fall behind. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So in order to put together a medicine before releasing to the public, like a, um, a business case or a business plan has to be put in place. You have to see if it's a viable kind of like building a, a building or a real estate venture you know what's the demand like in that area what's the purchasing power like is this a, 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 will this be a profitable medicine does it serve a purpose so those kind of studies go into what you know we would consider like a medicine off the shelf is that well bear in mind any medication that anyone wants to bring to market firstly you know you've got to identify the need for that medication because it is estimated that developing a new drug from bench to bedside, meaning from the lab to patients being able to use that medication, costs around $200 million. Any medication? Any major new medication. Any major new medication. Yes. So we're talking $200 million, five to 10 years of trials. Wow. Okay. So with any medication, it has to run through um, several levels of trial, what we call level, um, level one randomized trials, which is where... You give the drug to, um, you know, you do animal studies, 
Then you go to level two where you do um, human studies on a small number of volunteers to identify major side effects. Mm -hmm. You go to level three, which is gonna be a much larger trial looking at a lot more human volunteers. Then you enter what's called the post-marketing phase where you monitor um, you know, the drug in terms of side effects, uh, unexpected complications, et cetera. After it's passed all those steps, the information generated is then submitted to uh, the major regulators like the, the FDA, FDA in the US. Yeah. And then they make a judgment based on that. Okay. Now, if you're talking about medications that are sufficiently similar to drugs already in existence, the process is much, yeah. much faster. Yeah. And the same goes for surgical equipment. Okay. Um, so once you've got the approval, then yes, I'm sure you have to go into the whole mm -hmm. marketing, making the drug available. Remember, doctors do not embrace change. They're very resistant mm -hmm. to it. And then you and then enter the second stage where you need to market it to the doctors, to the hospitals, sometimes explaining why your more expensive drug may actually be better than older drugs. Obviously, pharmaceutical companies have their bottom line as one of their interests. So if you're talking about them trying to introduce a brand new expensive drug when an existing cheap drug that is now out of patent, meaning any company can make it, is available, that's when conflicts of interest can come to light and that's where life gets very easy. Yeah as certain drug companies who shall remain nameless found out in 2010 mm -hmm. when they were caught lying to the public. And mm -hmm. I would suggest anybody wanting to know who they are, just put it in on Google and enjoy the read. A few things, uh, I have an off-piece question and then one uh, that was gonna follow up, the one that I just uh, put forward. Um, the off-piece question, I heard you say uh, animal testing. We're in 2021, is, is, is there a way around, is there a tech out there that allows us to find out whether a medicine will work on humans Going on, going via non-animal testing. To be honest, you're now asking me about something that I have very little knowledge in. The, the the issue, though, is I mean, it is a very valid argument that animals will not always respond the way humans will, and you can't always predict a human response based on an animal response. One of the most infamous examples of this is a drug called thalidomide. This was a drug given to pregnant women in the 70s for uh, morning sickness. Animal studies suggested it was beautifully safe. And then the baby started being born without arms and legs. God. And then we realized, oh, there's a problem, huge recall, a lot of babies were harmed. So the argument with animal studies is that the animal studies allow you to titrate dose to predict the um, theoretical effects in human beings. It gives you a basis upon which to propose to then do human trials. Mm. Now, obviously you, you come down to the whole ethics of the issue and you know that I think is, is, is slightly, you know, a larger subject than can be given any weight in a few minutes. Um, but I would say that at this moment in time, you know, barring the use of genetic engineering to produce what are called chimeras. A chimera is an animal um, with multiple cell lines, um, sometimes from multiple species, you know, the stuff of science fiction, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Unless we can do that, um, we are always going to be limited in in the idea that we're going to have to experiment on animals before we experiment on yeah. people yeah uh, until human society says you know what no let's experiment on people but then we're going back to the days of the nazis yeah. and yeah. I'm, i think we all agree nobody wants to go back to those days yeah. um i i i i, no, not. <laughs> I can't uh, i can't help but uh but 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 feel that there are some doctors out there, and, for, and forgive the way I feel, maybe I watch too many movies, that are out to make a quick buck. Um, it's a business uh, before a concern over the health of the patient. In your line of work or in your travels, do you like get a front row seat to both kind of doctors, those who are out to make a quick buck of a patient, see them as a dollar sign, and those who are actually genuinely you know, wanna help the patient? Unfortunately, I have to say I see this or I hear examples of this every single day. Um, I'm not somebody who is not generous towards other people's motives. And I also know that sometimes, you know, patients are going to come to me and relay their experiences. But because they're patients, they're not going to have the medical insight to sometimes understand um, the, the different nuances of the advice they were given. Having said that, Unfortunately, some of my colleagues are not very clear in their com communication. They, they give the impression that talking to a patient is beneath them. So as a result, you can have sometimes a miscommunication whereby the patient thinks that the doctor is just after their money when the reality is the doctor isn't. Sadly, though, there are those who 
make it pretty clear with the way they behave that you know for them the money is a very very important mm-hmm. issue and you sometimes question where the patient care comes into that paradigm. Yeah, yeah. The problem though is people need to realize doctors can only operate and by operate I mean you know do the job within the limitations and confines that the patients set. If the patients are going to go back to those kind of doctors over and over again, complain about them, but still go back, those doctors are going to be empowered and they're going to be under the impression we're doing the right thing. Um, If patients are going to uh, vote with their feet and go to other doctors, then those doctors are gonna have to change what they do. Sometimes the perception is, okay, oh, this doctor is is charging a lot of money for for a surgery, for example. Um, Clearly for him, it's about the money. Well, sometimes when you've spent years training, studying, struggling to get to that point, you're being paid for your expertise. And if you, for example, compare the the surgical fees that we charge here in Sardinia with the fees that are being charged abroad, people here are getting a pretty hefty discount in comparison when you bear in mind that in some countries the the mean income is the same as the mean income here in Sardinia. Mm. So, you know, unfortunately, we do have the extremes in medicine. You've got people who will do things for free, uh, and you will have people who will basically try to do whatever they can to make the most money. Mm-hmm. I would say the majority of doctors fall in the middle. Yeah, that was my follow-up. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I would say the majority fall in the middle. You've got some outliers right and left. But I always, as I always say to patients, though, you know, if you're not happy with the doctor is saying, go elsewhere. Yeah. But at the same time, don't expect to get the best of everything for free because mm-hmm. it doesn't work like the way either, mm-hmm. right? So it is a complicated issue. And unfortunately, you know, while the majority of doctors are pretty conscientious, mm-hmm. sadly, there are some among our brethren who, for whatever reason, um, do not always follow the, or, or um, subscribe to the high standards that some of us try to yeah. to live by. Yeah. Um, What's the biggest health problem in our region? Ironically, and no pun intended, it is obesity. Because from what I can see, our obesity numbers are mirroring the numbers of the most unhealthy population on earth, and that is America. And Mm -hmm. I'm not saying this as a way of castigating America. I've got um, great affection for America. I've got a lot of American friends. Um, But the reality is that 88% of Americans are metabolically unhealthy and around 67% of Americans are either obese or overweight. And the reason they got that way, and obviously it is multifactorial, but when you follow the the graphs of, of increasing obesity rates over time, they coincide with the contamination of our food supply with ultra processed foods, junk food, which were designed to be addictive. I mean, and this is not a conspiracy theory. It is out there in in public. Unfortunately, you know, here in in this part of the world, people have embraced the the American fast food convenience lifestyle. So it's not the uh, rice and meat that that, that is traditional staple around here that is causing people to be obese. Our great grandparents' generation were not obese. They were Mm -hmm. eating that every day, okay? The problem is not because of willpower. It's not a willpower deficiency. But the reality is that these ultra-processed foods manipulate the dopamine pathways of the brain. They are as addictive as cocaine. So when you see people who are obese, you're essentially seeing the end result of a deliberate attempt to manipulate normal human biochemistry and physiology in order to fill the pockets of companies. And when you think that the annual profits in terms of ultra processed foods of these companies amount to around $600 billion, that is a hell of a lot of human misery. Yeah. So that is the biggest um, health uh, problem I see. Obesity walks hand in hand with metabolic um, uh, disease as well. Mm -hmm. And that by itself is, you know, implicated in all kinds of uh, disease states. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I thought for the longest time in in my little head? I, I always thought that the sugar business and the pharmaceutical business have quarterly meetings, you know? So sorry, I'm again off beast. Make, my, make the people sick gives me business. Well, ironically, um, when you look at the playbook that was followed by the tobacco companies, and you look at the playbook that's being followed by the pharmaceutical industry and also by the food companies, it looks surprisingly it? similar <laughs> because it's about advertisements. I mean, for example, let's see, when we talk about the smoking industry, they would pay scientists to say that there was no link between smoking and between lung cancer. Mm. The sugar industry is doing the same. 
and several professors at very prominent universities in the U.S. and Canada were caught out in the last few years, uh, taking money from Coca-Cola, saying Coca-Cola can be part of a normal healthy diet, a normal balanced diet, whatever that's supposed to mean, right? Um, so, you know, tobacco have done the same thing mm -hmm. as, as the sugar industry is doing now. Yeah. The sugar industry funded a lot of studies over the years that muddied the waters mm -hmm. in terms of is there a correlation between increased sugar intake and, and disease states? And yep. this was done deliberately because when you muddy the waters with a lot of publications, you make accountability very, very much harder. Mm -hmm. But you also ensure that you're then able to effectively buy expertise. Because look, let's remember, science and medicine are not like tech. They don't attract a lot of money. And you need money to perform studies to do your research. And you know when you are in debt, and you've got a lot of projects which you know are going to help people. And someone comes along and says, you know what, take our money, generate us some studies, we'll help you out in the long term. You can be temporarily uh, seduced into thinking, you know what, you know, I've got a PhD, I'm smarter than the guys coming to, to, to sell me this, let me just take their money and I will utilize their expertise to do my own research on the side mm -hmm. and then I will be able to uh, serve two masters. What happens 20 years later? They've bought you completely. Yeah. And to the point where, you know, anybody is corruptible. It doesn't matter how religious or how decent or how ethical, how moral you are. You put anybody in the right environment, you will corrupt them. Mm -hmm. And that sadly is what has happened. Unbelievable. Uh, I mean, I'm in marketing and when I'm in the States, I, I see how pretty, you know, the cereal boxes, the chocolates, the colors, you know, the shit. And, and my God, like, it, like I have trouble resisting, you know, that stuff. And that's what's happening here as well. You know, the, the, the use of, of red and yellow for food, uh, illustrating ketchup and mustard is almost everywhere. al here, yellow and red. Um, McDonald's, to name a few, yellow and red. Like there's a theme here that those are the two colors that really make you want to buy. And so much R&D goes into that just for, as a marketeer. Like it's crazy how much effort, time and, and sweat has gone into making that look um, appetizing for the consumer. And there we are, sitting ducks. I want that. Next thing you know, you know, you got type two, type two diabetes. They, a new study came out the other day. Sixty-one percent of the total caloric intake in children in the United Kingdom is from ultra-processed foods. And caloric is uh, calories. Just okay. So right. if you take your total a number of calories that you eat per day, sixty percent is from ultra-processed wow. foods. Wow. Which society has got eighty-eight percent metabolic? disease rate, 67% obesity rate, and is also eating 60% uh, caloric intake from ultra processed foods, America. Unfortunately, Americans are the victims of one of the most horrific mass experiments on human beings ever carried out by the food industry. Mm. And what they're experiencing in terms of ill health is not because they're a nation of, of people with no willpower, no. They're a nation of people where cheap addictive food yeah. has become so staple and unfortunately it is always the poor that suffer the most yeah. because you know you're a single mother five kids living in the projects you need to feed these kids yeah cheaply ten dollars is going to buy you a ton of ultra processed yeah. food it's not that you're not a bad mother yeah. you're a good mother trying to feed your kids under difficult situation this is why if you notice obesity rates among the rich among the affluent among the middle classes are significantly lower, lower. than among the poorer classes. Absolutely. And this yeah. is not an accident. Yeah, it's an inner city thing. You, you see it. I mean, um, yeah, it's off. I mean, what's $10 going to do to you in a supermarket? You know, not probably not that much. Well, exactly. But you also remember uh, the reason ultra processed foods are so cheap is because the the main ingredients in them, corn and, alt and high fructose corn syrup, yeah. Yeah. are subsidized by the government. Governments all over the world subsidize their farmers to produce these things. And it is scary, the effect that it's happening. Because remember, if the foods are so dirt cheap, how are farmers producing unprocessed food mm -hmm. going to compete unless they get subsidies? But no one's gonna give them subsidies because their profits are not 600 billion a year and they're not contributing towards campaigns. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. you wow. know. It, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a cycle, it's a vicious one. It is, and it's moving east. And it's moving east. That's the problem. Our direction. Mm -hmm. God be with us. Uh, Doc, you've been practicing uh, medicine in Saudi for, I want to say, a, a couple of decades now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, is there something that really bothers you, gets under your skin in your practice of medicine in Saudi Arabia? Uh, let me see my little list here. Okay, so 
I will say that I've only really practiced here in Jeddah, apart from a couple of um, short periods of time where I worked in the eastern province. So I would, you know, I will, I will not uh, generalize based on, on on the whole country. I'll okay. just generalize based on the city. Sure. So there are several problems I find as a an obstetrician gynecologist here in, in in Jeddah. Number one, I cannot always get the medications I need for my patient. If I need hormone replacement therapy, something you can find in any Boots in London or any Walgreens in the US, I don't have access to it. Basic medications for other female problems are not always available, meaning my wealthier patients can go abroad and get what they need. The not so wealthy are basically stuck in where they are. And that to me is the most pernicious rampant form of misogyny. So if people wanna talk about what real misogyny looks like, that is what it looks like. Who does that fall on? This, 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 I believe, is it's a function of the, the Ministry of Health, uh, the, the portion of the Ministry of Health that is addressing um, pharmaceuticals in the country. Okay. I do know that their job is complicated by the fact that, you know, some of the medications not being, um, you know, on patent, there are going to be issues with supply, etc. But I just really think that if they were to spend a little bit more time ensuring medication provision for women and maybe a little less running around trying to find all the doctors you know who are trying to work and 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 and, and, and deliver good patient yeah. care then perhaps there would be a little bit more progress in that direction maybe more women in their r&d department is there is that could that be an underlying issue quite possibly quite possibly that would be um that would make a huge difference mm. because remember the most when well-meaning man will never understand the uh the iniquities and the hardship that the average woman faces on a daily basis. Absolutely. So I would probably agree with you, yes, definitely. They would probably need an injection of women into that area. Um, I was brought up by a single mother. I see men and women as equal. Women are not owned by anybody. And I'm in a place where at times I have husbands who behave as though they own the woman in front of them. Um, it's why I take a pernicious delight in literally ignoring some of the husbands when they come to the clinic. Um, problem we have here in the country is we have a lot of very good laws, but they're ignored. Um, you know, as, as Shakespeare put it, they are more honored in the breach than in the observance. So for example, if I need to consent a patient for surgery, we still have men saying, no, no, I will consent. When I say no, the Ministry of Health says, you don't have the right. The, uh, you know, the, the, the people around me, the doctors, the nurses, etc., are all following the old way of no, the husband has to consent. This can sometimes slow down life-saving uh, treatment being given. So this is something I find particularly irritating. A lot of hospitals do not want to invest in the equipment that is needed for the delivery of optimal women's health. I'm an ultrasound specialist. My job is limited by the machines you give me. If you don't give me the right machines, I cannot do the right uh, ultrasound. Now the argument is always, oh, they're expensive. Okay, but any ultrasound machine is gonna make you back your money in three mm -hmm. months. So what's the excuse? You know, same thing goes for surgical equipment. And it doesn't seem to matter whether the, the chief medical officer is a male or a female. There seems to be a problem here in, in the city. Um, hospitals don't always want to invest in the right staff. The salaries are not high enough to attract the good people. Guess who you're not going to attract yeah. if the salaries are low, right? Patients, yeah. Exactly. Um, if we look at it from the patient point of view, now, you know, I always try to do my best for any patient coming to me, but sometimes patients are complicit in their own oppression. Mm -hmm. If you keep going back to doctors who you're complaining about, as we discussed a few minutes ago, those doctors are gonna be empowered. Mm -hmm. If you're going to keep complaining and, and writing formal complaints about every little thing that happens, giving, you know, not giving the benefit of the doubt to your doctors, not listening when they explain everything to you, not appreciating that uh, complication is not the same as negligence. You're gonna drive the good doctors out of the country. And I know several who have left because of this. And guess what happens when that happens? The bad doctors are left. Mm -hmm. In the United States, people are suing 90% of the time, not for money. They're suing because they want transparency. Here, it's probably the opposite. People are suing because they know a settlement will be made because unfortunately, the medical legal system is biased against doctors. We have colleagues of ours who stand in judgment on us and they do not give us the benefit of the doubt, no matter whether we've done everything um, that was required. Yeah. And you know, I myself was a victim of this, so I, I've seen it from the inside. Um, so, you know, we, we, we do have these issues because when you work in an environment where you know if a complication happens, uh, the patient is just going to sue immediately. Mm. Guess what happens next? Suboptimal patient care. 
women, for I'll give you an example. There is a, a condition uh, called endometriosis that causes chronic pelvic pain in around 70% of the women who have chronic pain and 40% of women with infertility have endometriosis. It can be a very nasty disease. One of the mainstays of treatment is radical surgery. And this is where we go into the abdomen and we free up uh, all uh, something called adhesions. This is where literally you have scar tissue putting organs together, creating pain. When you free up that scar tissue, there is a risk of injury to organs, injury that you can repair, okay? If I know as a surgeon that I'm gonna do my best, I'm gonna spend hours in surgery that I may not even be paid for, okay? But whatever happens at the end, if a complication occurs, that patient is gonna sue me and I'm gonna end up at the health directorate and then I'm gonna end up being fined and then I'm gonna end up uh, going through the stress and, 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 um, and the social opprobrium of that. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna open that patient's abdomen, I'm gonna take a look and I'm gonna close and I'm gonna say there's nothing I can do for you. Yeah. And all my colleagues will do the same and that woman will live in pain for the next 25 years. That isn't fair on her and it's not fair on the doctors. But there is only so much a doctor can do until you have to start protecting yourself. And that, unfortunately, is a major problem now. We don't see it from that side, by the way, as patients. I know. This is the, but, but this is also the issue because, you know, I've had a lot of patients where I've sat down, I've explained everything in detail, I've answered all the questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. The next minute I know, there's a, there's a complaint. I have a, a patient's uh, relative who wants to take me to court because I saved her life. The patient is happy. He's not happy with what I had to do to save her life. I'm waiting for the summons every day now. He wanted her dead? Well, unfortunately, it appeared he prized certain anatomical parts more than he prized the life of the person. And unfortunately, this is not an isolated incident because I can name you 15 of my colleagues who've had the same experience over the last couple of years. But let's just say that um, what I had to do was life affecting, okay. definitely life altering, but it, it meant that this, pa this, this patient lived to take care of her family mm -hmm. and has not been harmed from a health side from what I had to do. And what I had to do was textbook management of this condition in any book, in any journal, in any other jurisdiction in the yeah. world. And it's a very strange place yeah. where you save someone's life and you're totally transparent with the family and the patient herself is happy but someone else isn't, and you know that if they just get to the right person, there's gonna be a complaint made against you, and nobody is gonna to listen to anything you have to say because you're the evil doctor, and that's the poor innocent patient who is the victim of your malfeasance, and that essentially is the environment that we work in. So no, it is, it is very challenging, um, but it is what it is. Wow, doc, that's, that's, um, thanks for sharing that. That was some um, heavy stuff, but, but thank you. know Because us as patients, we don't see the other side of the coin. And, um, and, you know, we come with our frustrations, but, you know, guess what? Doctors have their own as well. So thanks for, you know, shedding some light on that. Um, let's move on. Um, sure. When we were on the phone a few days ago, you, uh, you mentioned, you gave me a bullet point and you're like, Mo, you know, let's discuss this. So I want you, if you could talk a little bit about um, what you said uh, regarding the silent epidemic of insulin resistance and how it's involved in multiple common health issues. Okay. Globally, I guess, not just in Saudi. Perfect. So. Firstly, before we talk about insulin resistance, let's sort of get a broad idea of what it is. Because I don't want anyone ever listening to something I say thinking, no, I can't ask him to clarify what's going on. So insulin resistance, what is insulin? Insulin is a hormone in our bodies that is responsible for um, controlling our blood sugar. It's responsible for um, stimulating the synthesis, meaning the building of protein in the body. Protein is responsible for the cells of your body, your muscles of your body, hormones, and other things. Insulin is also uh, involved in the inflammatory state of the body as well. So insulin is an incredible organ, okay? Mm -hmm. To the point where um, bodybuilders, professional bodybuilders, are actually using insulin injections in order to get bigger. So yeah. insulin is a, is a damn impressive um, uh, hormone. How does insulin work in the body? It works in something called receptors. So the insulin will approach your cell, uh, it will attach to a receptor on the cell, and that will then mediate the changes within the cell. Now with insulin resistance, the cells cannot respond to the insulin in the body. What is the end result? The body through the pancreas cranks up the amount of insulin, okay? 
in order to overcome that resistance. Yeah. And then essentially what happens at the end point, and I'm oversimplifying this as well, you know, to a huge extent, um, is that the body can no longer respond to that insulin, which is why you then end up with the end result of type two diabetes. diabetes. However, as the insulin is going up, you're causing inflammatory uh, infl inflammation in the body. And a recent study came out looking at um, what are the biggest risk factors for heart disease. Insulin resistance was right at the top above cholesterol, wow. above high blood pressure, above diabetes by itself, okay? So it is a silent epidemic because they estimate 88% of the American population is insulin resistant. Now insulin resistance is, a, is a, um, a spectrum. It starts right at the beginning where your insulin is slightly elevated and it ends up at the end where it is very much elevated. So you've got years in order to deal with the issue, okay? now. What is the importance of insulin resistance? It has been implicated in around 10 different cancers, as in directly involved in causing those cancers. Wow. It has been associated with another 20 cancers in terms of the response of cancer cells to increased levels of insulin. It is involved in a condition called polycystic ovary syndrome, which is a very common syndrome over here in the Middle East and also in the West. Um, it is involved in high blood pressure. It is involved in coronary artery disease, uh, strokes, even dementia, there is a role for high insulin in Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia. Um, Dr. Benjamin Bickman wrote a beautiful book about insulin resistance where he listed around the 50 different um, uh, disease states that insulin resistance is implicated in. So it is a silent killer moving through populations, wow. okay? Now, is it, is it involved with diabetes, or sorry, with, with obesity? Yes. 50% of obese patients have got insulin resistance, but not every patient with insulin resistance is, is obese, which is why I said you can't just look at someone and decide, oh, yeah. they're healthy, yeah, right? Yeah. So this, this is a silent epidemic. It is being fed by the uh, ultra-processed food contamination of our food supply, but also by lifestyle factors. So yeah. for example, if you don't get enough sleep tonight, you will be insulin resistant for the next five days. So under seven, six or seven hours, you're gonna, it's gonna affect the next five days of your life. Yes, but not just that. Remember, why would you be up all night? You might have been up because a relative of yours was sick and you were in the ER of the hospital. That's a form of stress. Yeah. Guess what else raises your insulin and causes resistance? Stress. Stress, yeah. right? Throw that on with your eating habits. Mm -hmm. Throw that on with certain medications. Throw that on with, with genetic susceptibility. Mm -hmm. This is a perfect storm. Yeah. And we did not have this problem until our food supply was contaminated to the extent that we have it now. Now, unfortunately, a lot of doctors do not measure insulin resistance because not all of them are familiar with the concept of it, which is a very strange thing to think about. But it is the reality because I never heard about it at med school. It's something I've learned many years later in my interest in ketogenic diets and health and optimal weight loss for women and, and, and in my own health. So, you know, this is definitely something that has to be treated. It can be treated. It can be cured. It does not require medication. But again, you know, it is something that if it's not um, recognized, it can be cooking away in the background. Mm -hmm. You won't realize it because ironically, the final step before you get type 2 diabetes is where your insulin levels are so high that your blood sugar is still normal. It's like you fall off a cliff soon mm -hmm. after that, and that's when the type two diabetes presents itself. Wow. So there, there is no, it, it's black or white almost, you know, it just happens pretty much overnight. Well, not necessarily overnight, but the, the issue is the insulin resistance takes time to start, takes okay. time to build. The body is an amazing uh, machine, essentially. It tries to overcome that by cranking up the insulin, and for a short while that works. Yeah until the receptors are no longer responding to that higher level, and yep. then it cranks up further. So the, the good thing about all this is it means you've got time to address the underlying problem yep. because you can, you can reverse it through careful dietary manipulation mm -hmm. and attending to your sleep and stress and other factors, right? But again, it is, it is something that because we're not taught about it at med school, a lot of doctors aren't aware of it. Is the list of diseases that stem from the lack of insulin, is that list growing with time? It is growing because we are finding out more and more each day. I'll give you an example from my own specialty. I have an interest in gynecological oncology, which is the uh, cancers of the, the female genital tract. And I never realized, despite all my reading in the specialty, that ovarian cancer cells mm. 
have got a lot of insulin receptors on them. Oh, wow. And when I went reading further, I read that women with insulin resistance have got worse outcomes. Mm -hmm. I never knew this. I've gone through board exams. I've read textbooks on the issue. That was never addressed in those textbooks because we can't address everything, right? Yeah. Um, but the list is growing. Even cancers that do not appear to have an, an insulin um, element to their uh, growth, you find that they're in the background, there are insulin receptors that yeah. nobody had talked about before. Yeah. So, oh no, the list is growing. We're growing. talking about common diseases, but also less common diseases. Yeah. And the beautiful thing is, like anything in life, if you go for the root cause, you may potentially alter the final outcome, even if you do get those diseases ultimately. Right? Yeah, yeah, got it. Uh, on the subject of reversing uh, sicknesses or viruses, mm -hmm. um, Cancer, which is obviously tricky for everyone because it's one of the few things uh, out there that we don't have an answer to. And maybe we can get to that later on. Um, is cancer something that can be reversed away from uh, chemotherapy? Um, is there something we can do like naturally or organically to, to, to help reverse cancer? In a simple answer, no. Okay. However, we need to be clear that cancer is not one disease. So cancer of the brain is not cancer of the ovary, is not cancer of the lungs, is not cancer of the kidney. So cancer is just a general term for a broad spectrum of multiple diseases. The mainstay of cancer therapy, depending on the type of cancer, can be either surgery or chemotherapy or radiotherapy or a combination. Okay. What we know now with a limited area of research uh, that has been spearheaded by uh, people like Dominic D'Agostino um, at the University of South Florida or Dr. Colin Champ at the University of Pittsburgh is that with careful therapeutic dietary manipulation, we can potentially reduce the toxicity of some of the agents we use. So for example, in some of the blood cancers, a ketogenic diet has been found in very small studies to reduce the risks of chemotherapy, as in the side effects of chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. With certain brain cancers, the side effects of radiotherapy have been reduced with the use of the ketogenic diet. We know in the breast cancer literature, uh, when they looked at follow-up and long-term longevity in some breast cancer populations, they found that patients who were eating a lower carbohydrate diet, not a ketogenic diet, but just a lower amount of carbs, for some reason had less recurrence than patients that were eating a regular diet. So what I want people to understand is I'm not suggesting that diet will ever cure cancer. Mm. I'm not suggesting diet will prevent cancer. What I'm saying is, that when a patient is uh, sadly diagnosed with cancer, there may in some cases be a role for dietary manipulation as an aid to what's going on. Because if a patient can handle the complications of a treatment, they can tolerate the treatment better, meaning they can stay the course. Because some cancer treatments are very toxic and patients cannot handle the treatment and they have to stop the treatment. So, you know, there is a lot of uh, research going on there, but I would just recommend any patient, you know, please, whoever you go to for your cancer, always make sure that you are receiving the treatment that has got the most evidence to back it up. Mm -hmm. Chemotherapy, radiotherapy, when you think about them, are barbaric. But we've got 100 years of literature, studies, to back up what we're doing. And, you know, it's a less than perfect solution, but it is the most scientific solution, and through science is where uh, the path lies in, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in addressing cancer. Without us saying, of course, that we shouldn't look at the uh, the rest, because for example, there are some forms of gynecological cancer where if they're caught early, surgery alone is a, is, is sufficient. But in the long term, a lot of those patients will end up dying of lifestyle disease, mm. heart disease, for example. So you really need to address the whole patient and not just you've got a cancer of this organ. We're going to focus on the organ and forget the body around the organ. Can you specify what the biggest cause of cancer is? If I wanted to tell you, Doc, this is actually a question that I really want to know the answer to. Doc, how do I avoid getting cancer? What would you say? I would say we need to stipulate which kind of cancer, because remember, cancer is not one disease. Mm. And then we need to talk about, um, you know, do you have a genetic component? Because there are some cancers that there is a genetic component that makes the, the risk of that cancer extremely high. Um, we can sometimes intervene to reduce that. You know, for example, um, there is a mutation called the BRCA mutation that increases the risk of breast cancer and ovarian cancer. If a woman comes to me with a BRCA1 mutation and I remove her ovaries at the appropriate time, 
I've reduced her risk of ovarian cancer by 80%. Wow. But that still means she has a 20%, 20%. chance. Now, now, how can I tell her to... Uh, what to do to, to stop that 20% being an issue. Mm-hmm. I wish I could say a ketogenic diet, but we don't know yet. Yeah. So, you know, they estimate one in one in five to one in six people will be diagnosed with cancer. The incidence of cancer has gone up over the years. You wonder whether there is an element of insulin resistance playing a role here. Mm-hmm. But like I said, cancer is multifactorial. You know, you can see perfectly healthy people who get cancer, yeah. perfectly unhealthy people who don't get cancer. So it, it is a very complex area. Sounds it. Do more people recover from cancer or fall victim to it? Again, uh, it depends which cancer we're talking about because there are some cancers where if you catch them late mm. and you treat them, patient makes a full recovery, ironically oh, enough. Oh, when you catch it late? Some cancers, yes. There are some cancers, if you catch them late, most patients are not going to survive. There are others where if you catch them early, you treat them, patient may never have a recurrence. Mm-hmm. Or it might be a particular form of cancer where a recurrence is inevitable, yeah. even if you catch it early. So you just can't generalize, to be honest. But I mean, with the advances we've made in, in chemotherapy, radiotherapy, new group of medications now called biologics, and the the incredible amount of research that we're doing in the field, you know, it has probably never been a better time to have cancer because we've just got so many options now. Yeah. Um, but again, like I said, it's it all comes down to the kind of cancer because kind of cancer, you've yeah. got some cancers where we've made no strides over the last 50 years. We still don't know why this cancer turns up late. And because we can't pick it up early, by the time we know it's there, it's too late. Too late, yeah. Uh, you mentioned keto diet. I know you're big on that. Um, I've got a body mass index of maybe just over 20. Um, would it be something that I should look into? Would it help me? Well, it all depends on what your health issues are, mm. because you know, again, let's let's say for argument's sake, your your body mass index is twenty, but it doesn't tell me anything about what's happening under the hood. So, for all I know, I might draw your insulin now, and find your insulin is elevated because you're healthy, but things are happening under the hood that you're not aware of. So, in that case, the question would then be: All right, would you benefit from a ketogenic diet? I mean, we need to remember, you know, what is a ketogenic diet? People misunderstand it. Ketogenic diets are not about eating massive amounts of fat to the exclusion of most other things. A ketogenic diet is about what we call therapeutic carbohydrate restriction. It can range from zero carbs to 150 carbs, depending on your physical activity, depending on what your 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 health goals are. It's not a cure for everything. Not everybody does well on a ketogenic diet. Not everybody needs a ketogenic diet because a ketogenic diet is usually where you're talking about uh, in most people not going above 40 to 50 grams of carbs a day. For some people that is over restrictive. They can't sustain that. The ketogenic diet is is a therapeutic intervention. People think it's a diet. It is not a diet, quote unquote. We need to go back to the history of it. When did it start? To treat epilepsy in children. Okay, until we had the drugs, uh, the anti-epileptic drugs from the 50s and 60s onwards, this was the only thing we had to be able to control seizures in children. It's incredibly effective for them but it is also very difficult on the families. And that is why the drugs came in and took over. So, you know, that is where the ketogenic diet started, but it has multiple um, uses in other populations. For example, you know, patients who are high blood pressure, even diabetics, people who have got insulin resistance, women with polycystic ovary syndrome, some people who are addicted to carbohydrates. And this is also, you know, a a problem of today's world. People, you know, misunderstand that it's not that they have a a willpower problem. They're addicted to carbs and not any carbs, because remember, carbohydrates can be refined or unrefined. The kind that we are in danger from are the refined carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. So to answer your specific question, I mean, only, only you would be able to know if the ketogenic diet would help you based on your own medical history. And that's why I I always say to people, um, don't try to do it yourself because it needs supervision, careful supervision. It's what I tell my patients. You can't just come to me and I sit with you for an hour, tell you what to eat, you go away. You got to come back. I need to measure your body fat. I need to talk to you about your satiety, meaning your ability to eat and be full. I need to talk to you about the problems you have making it um, uh, sustainable for you. Mm-hmm. What issues are you having societally wise? Is your family supportive? Or do they keep trying to jeopardize you by putting cake in front of you, for example? Yeah. Are, the, are you able to eat the foods on this diet? Are you feeling good? Are you not feeling good? So, you know, it's it's all of that together. So yeah, yeah. that would make it more difficult for me to answer that question simply, would you benefit from it? Okay, but, but I mean, it could help towards uh, weight loss and a healthier lifestyle if, if it's something that suits 
uh, uh, you know, your, um, your body or your blood type or whatever. It is something that could, you know, go a long way in helping me lose weight if I wanted to. It is one of the many ways that are sustainable, mm -hmm. that are enjoyable, and that are helpful. But what I always say to people is weight loss, for example, is not about calorie counting. Okay, calorie counting does not work because it's not sustainable. Okay. Okay. Um, but there are many ways to health. That's why I said at the beginning, health is a journey, right? It's not the destination. And everybody has to find what works for them. Some people, ketogenic diet is too restrictive. For them, I would say, no, let's go low carb. What's the difference? You're keeping carbohydrates below 150 grams a day. Ketogenic diets are usually around the 50, 60 gram mark, sometimes as, as low as zero, depending on what the problem is, right? Some people, they don't do well with that. They do well with a very high protein, low fat diet. Some people do very well on a vegetarian, high carb, low fat diet. And you know, you can use that, for example, to reverse insulin resistance, something I didn't know till I increased my reading on the issue last year. Um, some people do well on a new kind of diet called the carnivore diet, which is basically no carbs at all, just pure animal products. Others, you know, despite my own reservations as to how healthy the vegan diet is, some people do very well on a vegan diet. So what I would always say to anyone is experiment and figure out what works for yeah. you. Yeah. Remember, doctor, I told you that I have these uh, skipped ectopic heartbeats that just drive me nuts. Oh, yes. My wife put me on a two week, three week program vegan after week one. They went away. You know, but I'm just not a fish guy. Um, I need my meat. I need my chicken. So I went fish and plant based three weeks it was the best three weeks of my life and then like any person i just went back to what what gives me the most harm but that works you know it's what you put in your body you are what you eat but you make a very good point there the reason you went off it after three weeks is not because the program is flawed it's because it wasn't sustainable for you correct and and that is why you know issues like that that's why i always say to people you know you've got to take the time to experiment you've got to take the time to see what it is that you can sustain. I mean, I've experimented on myself with every single eating plan known to man because I want to know what my patients are going through. I don't like it when patients come to me saying I'm booking for gastric bypass because I've tried every diet and nothing has worked. Yeah. Invariably, I find they tried calorie counting because someone who was supposed to be an expert told them to do this and guess what, it didn't work. Yeah. Um, so for example, when I tried the carnivore diet, I had some brilliant, you know, some, some, I was tracking my, my, my macros, I was tracking my body fat percentage, I was going down in all the numbers I wanted to decrease and going up in all the numbers I wanted to increase, you know, body fat, uh, mm -hmm. bo sorry, muscle uh, percentage and so forth. Mm -hmm. I had to quit it. I could not sustain an eating program that didn't allow me to have a salad. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't allow me to have a, a quarter of a banana now and then, you know, plums, uh, some grapes. I could not do it. It's too aggressive. Yeah. But there I know there are people, they can do it for 25 years. They are the picture of health and they don't feel that they're um, missing anything. Yeah. So. Again, everybody is biochemically unique. You gotta know what works for you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, doc, by trade, or like, you know, one, one of the most things you are known for medically is a uh, gynecologist. You're a gynecologist here in Saudi Arabia. Um, I would assume there's some challenges being such in our country. Do you face any? You know, apart from the, the challenges that I mentioned, um, you know, before, and when, when you were asking me about uh, challenges of working here in the kingdom, um, you know, occasionally you, you do as a male, of course, um, you have to pick up the pieces of someone else's mistakes. So I have patients coming to me who've been traumatized by another doctor, sometimes a male, sometimes a female, and I'm the one that has to pick up those pieces. And it can be difficult um, because, for example, if they were examined and they were hurt, they are going to be traumatized and you have to work through that. And that takes a lot of patience. And it takes a lot of understanding on the part of, of the patient. Sometimes, as I said, you know, I, I, I have patients coming to me where the husband is behaving as though his wife is his, his personal um, object to possess. And I take a malicious uh, enjoyment in, in going out of my way to make it very clear to those kind of people that when you come into my house, my clinic, mm. there's only one person dictating, and that is me. And what I say is the only person that's going to say anything here is the patient herself. And she's not going to be silenced, she's mm -hmm. not going to be spoken over, and she's not going to be spoken down to by anybody. I love it. And uh, you know, some of the husbands like this, some of them don't like it. Unfortunately, you gotta find someone who cares, because I don't, if you don't like it. 
sometimes, um, and I understand this from, from a patient perspective, you know, it can be very embarrassing coming to a gynecologist. As part of my job, I need to examine them. Um, and, you know, I'm looking at it from her point of view. I'm coming to a doctor, a man, for the first time, you know. First few minutes, he's asked me some very intimate questions. Next few minutes, he wants to examine me. You know what I mean? This is too embarrassing for me. So I get that. And, and one thing that a lot of my patients don't realize is I'm probably as embarrassed as they are when it comes to examining them. It's, it's not just, oh, it's ordinary for me. I've done this for years. No, no, no. I still get very nervous having to examine a patient because I know how embarrassing it is for them. So that doesn't help because when a patient sees you sort of a little nervous or on edge, they will justifiably get the wrong idea that, oh, what's wrong with him? He's not confident. So then you have to affect an air of nonchalance over that air of um, um, nervousness, yeah. which, which can be a bit of an issue. Absolutely. Um, but, you know, like, like I said, you know, it, it basically goes back to the, the issues we discussed before. You know, the environment isn't the most helpful environment to doing the job. And sometimes it can be very frustrating when you're trying to do the best for a patient and you're frustrated because the equipment you need isn't there, the test you need isn't there, the confidentiality around the test may not be there. For example, I've had patients come to me where they wanted to be tested for, for sexually transmitted diseases because they'd been exposed. Now, I remember having to send them away to another lab so that there would be no danger that somebody in the same clinic would recognize the name and then, you know, connect two things together. Mm. Now, that shouldn't be something that I have to deal with. But it is a sad reality that confidentiality isn't necessarily the the biggest thing that we we have as a strength here. Um, other things, again, it's, you know, I, I believe in, in, in confidentiality. So sometimes, for example, when I'm at the hospital, come out of the OR, come out of a delivery room, you find the entire family there waiting for you. Now, I like that about our culture because it really shows love and concern. What I don't like is everyone thinking they have the right to hear the details of the patient's condition. And that's why I'm not very popular with families, especially at delivery time, because I make it very clear. I speak to the patient. Yeah. I'll speak to the husband if she gives me permission, but I'm not entertaining anyone else with details. And if anyone wants to ask anything, they do it in front of her. Mm -hmm. So, you know, obviously this, this, this goes against the grain for, for people, but it is who it is what it is when it comes to me. But, you know, other, other than that, I mean, with all the challenges, it's still very rewarding yeah. because, you know, when a patient says thank you, that's worth its weight in gold. Yeah, Ma makes your... Exactly. It, ma it makes the struggle worthwhile um, because there's a lot of struggle sometimes. Yeah. Doc, you operate in a very Western way or manner. Have you done some time there? Is that where you uh, studied? I was born and brought up in London. Okay. Um, I was there till I was 19. I applied to med school here because I didn't get in there the first time. And by some miracle, I got in here. And then I thought, OK, I got into med school. You know, I may not get in in London if I apply. Let me continue here. And, you know, I came back home and I went through med school. Then I uh, after three years of working here, I went to Canada, did my residency, my fellowship there. And um, so, you know, I'm, I'm a child of both cultures, mm -hmm. but I was, I was born and raised in, in England. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that is why I have certain thoughts and certain uh, perspectives. Obviously, being raised by a single mother means that you have an above average respect and regard for women because I've never seen a woman not be able to achieve what a man can achieve. So I, I really don't have time for... Um, benign misogyny yeah, or entertaining that bullshit exactly yeah. it's like you're a woman doesn't mean anything to me yeah. you're a person yeah. you know i'm going to judge you by what you do yeah, not by the fact that you're a female and uh, you know alhamdulillah so far that 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 approach has worked and yeah. you know some of the most impressive people i know who trained me who are related to me even are women so yeah. i love that yes it was inevitable i would go into yes, gynecology sir. yes sir <laughs> <laughs> Um, the last two years, obviously, Corona and, and all that uh, craziness that happened. Lockdown. Some countries were for lockdowns and it worked. In other countries, they didn't impose lockdown like Sweden. And, um, and it worked as well. I have a friend of mine who lives in Dubai. I won't name him. He was, he's so anti the lockdowns. And you know, he's always pushing the narrative that you know, we should not have lockdowns. People should be free. Um, compartmentalize the old and the sick is something that I remember him saying a lot. Um, was locking down the correct thing to do? I mean, is where do you stand on that, if you can comment? The beauty of not having to be responsible for a country is that you are free to have an opinion uh, without having to worry about the implications of that opinion. And that's what I always say to people, that I am very uh, a, 
aware of the privilege I have in that I don't have the responsibility for millions of people. But when you are talking about science, there is only one path. That is science. Yeah. Okay. In 2019, the WHO came out with a pandemic playbook in preparation for a pandemic. And they said clearly, you, co you, you isolate the uh, at risk. You do not um, lock down. You do not mask up. You do not go crazy. Okay. You live your life normally. You let um, normal biology proceed. And you don't shut down the economy and you don't shut down society. Now, study that came out that was published in The Lancet, another study that came out of Stanford, and a third study, I don't remember where that was published, all looked at what are called non-pharmaceutical interventions, like lockdowns, mask use, washing hands, and so forth. And if we talk about specifically lockdowns, lockdowns only spread the number of cases along a longer set of time. They do not save lives. They cause more harms. It is estimated that this year alone, 200,000 women and children will die as a result of healthcare not being delivered because of lockdowns. In Southeast Asia, 600,000 children have died of starvation in the last year. In the United States, they estimate 250,000 are going to miss their cancer screenings, meaning that early cancers are not going to be caught early. We've had an explosion of mental health disorders in the West, especially among children. We've had education harmed. Um, and when you look at the countries that have locked down versus the ones that didn't, and as you said, Sweden was an outlier and acted as a control group. Sweden is currently number 22 in terms of the most deaths from COVID-19. So, you know, Again, as someone who doesn't have responsibility for other people, has the luxury of that, I would say I follow the science. The WHO put the science there. Everyone signed up to it. Everybody just decided not to follow it for reasons, you know, that they know better than I do. But no, I definitely don't agree with the concept of a lockdown because, among other things, if you take the United Kingdom as a brilliant example, they essentially shut down parts of the healthcare. They like to deny it, but sadly for them, you know, we have a media that, that, that exposes uh, the facts that other people don't necessarily want to come to light. They shut down part of the health service. They built a cohort of obese people who didn't get their care, who were unable to exercise, unable to go out, unable to address their health. They built up a cohort of patients with heart disease too scared to go to the hospital, patients with um, strokes too scared to go to the hospital, cancer patients who were not treated or diagnosed. Guess what happened in January of this year? All those people tipped over like off a cliff and admissions to hospital went through the roof. Wow. They built a cohort of sick people, okay? And when you look at the majority of the people admitted to the ICUs in the UK, they were obese. Did you hear that on the news? No, you didn't. Where did I hear this? Their own documentation, which is available on Google. Mm. Okay, so no, I uh, I do not, uh, you know, I do not subscribe to the idea that lockdowns were were useful, and it's not my opinion. That is what the science says. If somebody yeah. doesn't like that opinion, well, you have to address the science because I didn't publish those papers. Yeah. I didn't go into the details. Um, you know, unfortunately, the, the the biggest international public health disaster of all time is unfolding in front of our eyes. This is it, no? This is it. And you know, and this is not to say that COVID-19 is not harmful. It is harmful. When people say, oh, it's just a flu, I've got bad news for you. The flu kills around half a million people annually, globally, per year. The common. Common flu, all ages, from babies to senior citizens. Mm -hmm. The flu is not a benign problem. Mm -hmm. Most of us get flu and we recover from it. We confuse the flu with a cold. The flu is a serious disease, okay? Um, COVID-19 might have a survival rate of zero point, uh, sorry, a uh, fatality rate of 0.05% in the under 70s. 99.95% of people who get COVID-19, yes, they make a recovery, but that doesn't mean that we don't mourn the loss of lives, mm. especially when you look at who died of this condition. 
the average age of death in the UK was 81. The average age in the US was 82. Now, I'm the opposite of a lot of people. I actually adore the older citizens. For me, someone dying at 81 is the loss of 81 years of knowledge, of experience, of wisdom that society has lost. It's not, oh, we've lost somebody economically unproductive. No, I think economically unproductive are the teenagers or the ones in their 20s because they haven't contributed to society like that the older ones have. So even if the majority of people that died of COVID-19 had risk factors, for example, if you are diabetic or hypertensive or you have metabolic disease or you're obese, your risk of having a complicated course or being admitted to hospital or dying is around five to seven times greater than someone who doesn't have those comorbidities. That doesn't make your life any less meaningful. So, you know, while I do believe we have to protect the most vulnerable, we cannot use fear as a means of of, of establishing um, a way of doing things that harms a lot of people. Because remember, we are estimating that the uh, the body count from all the lockdowns, from none COVID causes, is going to exceed the loss from COVID causes. And that is a big problem. And especially if you look at how the deaths have been recorded in the US and the UK, there are question marks as to how many of those deaths were actually COVID deaths. So if we're saying now that the non-COVID deaths are going to exceed the COVID deaths, we're talking about an inflated number which means it's even more of a moral disaster than we've already taken credit for. Mm. So limiting the access for those who couldn't get medical care due to COVID restrictions. Well, exactly. That's I mean, profound. I have a relative of mine who almost missed their cancer surgery because of the cancer surgery shutdown. And then they had their surgery in a manner that was suboptimal for them because of their health factors, because of the fear of, of COVID-19 transmission in the OR. Yeah. Um, and I know multiple relatives who had, you know, appointments pushed back, who weren't able to see their doctor. This is in the United Kingdom. Um, and at the end of the day, the health service was never overwhelmed. Yeah. So, you know, and, you know, I was very impressed, to be honest, with how uh, Serdia managed the problem. I was very, very impressed with the relatively lower um, death rate. Yeah. You know, how things were, were managed here was, uh, you know, it was a very pleasant surprise yeah. that we managed it better than a lot of Western countries yeah, yeah. did. Um, we were a bit of a case study, I think. Well, exactly, exactly. Now, my thing is always about, you know, learn from mistakes, learn from what you did wrong, learn from other people's experience. Mm. Unfortunately, there are countries currently around the globe who it seems are determined to continue making even bigger mistakes and you know you just have to question what's going on and why is this happening you know all the conspiracy theories floating around unfortunately too many of these conspiracy theories turned out to be right so now i don't know what to believe anymore yeah yeah i I noticed it here when they locked down for three or four weeks however long it was when they open you know um when they give you the opportunity to go into supermarket all it's causing is a bottleneck and um and I think they came to the realization that, uh, okay, you know what, let's not lock down. And, um, and luckily, we didn't go into a second or third wave of lockdown. So, you know, trial and error, and eventually, alhamdulillah, I think they did very well. Well, this is it. I mean, it's, it's ironic that a third world country is learning and managing and doing things better than a lot of these first world countries mm. that we all look up to as the experts in all fields yeah, of endeavor. The irony. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, this is why I think that uh, a lot of the countries that locked down and kept locking down, they missed a wonderful opportunity to address the elephant in the room, obesity and insulin resistance. Think how how much healthier populations could be if 13 months ago they started a, uh, a campaign. Nobody did. And again, you have to ask why. And unfortunately, I don't like where that question leads me because... It's, it's a rather dystopic and a rather uh, tragic place that yeah. it leads you to. Yeah. Any chance it was man-made? Ah, uh, you're not asking me things that are way above my level of expertise, but... Next uh, question. <laughs> <laughs> In a short answer, elevator uh, response. <laughs> any chance? Any chance? I think there's been too many suspicious factors around this whole issue. Mm-hmm. Um, we're talking about the, rele- the, the origin of a virus from a country that has already sent the world several other viruses over the last 20 years. Um, so the issue is, you know, was this a tweaked virus 
scientists who've looked at the data are saying yes. There was a paper that was suppressed over the last year, uh, co-authored by Professor Angus Douglas, uh, an oncologist from the National Health Service in the UK. And nobody wanted to publish this paper that was like 20 pages long, which apparently gave a lot of um, circumstantial evidence that yes, this was a manipulated virus. Question is, you know, was it released deliberately or by accident? Mm -hmm. Most human endeavor is accidental. It's not a conspiracy. So, but again, this is, you know, way above my, <laughs> my expertise and knowledge. And, you know, I'll leave it to the people that are responsible for, for ascertaining these interesting and, and ultimately important um, answers. Fair play, fair play, doctor. Um, how long do you see yourself doing this for, uh, Doc? Does it like does a doctor ever retire? I mean, you know, you'd be on a plane. Do we have a doctor on board? You're needed to be there. Do you ever see yourself in the near future retiring, resigning, or do you want to go until you know sixty, seventy plus, inshallah? I have a cousin who's a cardiologist, and I look up to him because I love his attitude. Um, his attitude is medicine isn't my job; it's my hobby. Mm. Um, in my case, I love what I do, despite the challenges. I love taking care of my patients. I love being involved in their care. And not because of an, an ego thing or anything, but because I genuinely care about, about the people that come to see me. I cannot see a day where I retire if we define retirement as totally stopping any you know role within a medical framework. Now, with ultrasound, the beautiful thing is you know, you can do it until you're 90, essentially, until your eyes start to fail, until you start to get shoulder pain, etc. So, you know, I can definitely see myself 60s, 70s, maybe longer, uh, continuing to have some kind of um, clinical practice. I do want to go back to university and read history when I do retire. So maybe that will get in the way. Um, but I just can't see myself not being involved because, you know, the more we find out about um, uh, pathogenesis background to a lot of the problems that my patients face with the issue of insulin resistance that influences so much of what I do, with the advances in surgery, with the knowledge that we get now in terms of, of gynecological cancer care and so forth. I just can't see myself just being on the sidelines. You know, even if I was just there in some sort of administrative capacity or, or supervisory role or even just an advisory role of some kind, I just can't see myself resigning anytime soon um, or, or at all, to be honest. It's probably because you, you love what you do. I mean, you go into the clinic every day, really in, in enjoying what you do. What's the most thing you enjoy about when you're there? Like, what's the most thing you enjoy about medicine in general? I get a rush from operating. I love surgery. I cannot emphasize that too much. But like I always say to patients, there is only one thing that I love more than surgery, mm. and that is finding a way to avoid surgery for my patient because ultimately she is going to live with the successes and failures, the complications and the problems of any surgical procedure I perform for her. So I particularly love the surgery, but what I also love is getting to know the patients and their families. I mean, I always tell this to patients, if you're thinking you're gonna come and see me on time, that's not gonna happen. You're gonna walk in, you're gonna be delayed 20, 30 minutes. I'm going to grovel and apologize. But five minutes into my consult, you're gonna be happy that I kept you waiting because I will never take time from one patient to give to another. I would rather be apologizing for the entire evening because I do value people's time. But I also value the fact that what I do is delicate, it is intimate, it is sensitive. You need time to build up a rapport with patients. That takes time. And I enjoy taking that time because you can address a number of issues that they didn't even ask you about. Because if you treat the whole patient, you are going to have a healthier patient. And, and if anything, I am happy when the patients don't come back because I've managed to address the problem they had. Yeah. It's not good for business, but I'm not in this game just for business. No, I didn't. So, I don't take you for one yeah. that does, yeah. Well, a doctor, thank you so much for your time. I, I no, mean, I, I, I always said, I always said the best people, if you, you know, were to look at like the um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs equivalent, I think the best people on the planet are those that help others. Um, and then come every, comes everyone else. Um, and I put you at the top of the list. Um, oh, thank you very much. I feel smarter just being around you. Mashallah, Alex, so articulate. I've learned a couple of things today. I'm going to, you know, probably learn a bit more as I watch this episode. And I hope other people do as well. I want to put uh, the links for when anyone can reach out to you uh, in the description box in YouTube. 
Um, I am so excited about this episode. I think it's one of the best. And thank you for taking over an hour from your time, doctor, to come out here and um, and share your stories with me. And if there's anything you want to put out there for people, any advice, you know, into living a healthier life, um, then 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 please, um, if there's anything we missed out, please uh, do do share. Well, firstly, thank you very much for the the opportunity. You're you're too kind. Um, all I would say to to patients um, is. Do not sell yourself short and trust your instinct. If you feel that the doctor that you're talking to doesn't get you, doesn't understand the problem that you're facing, not necessarily from a medical point of view only, but also from a a social point of view. If you find that your doctor doesn't seem to want to explain why they want to do things, if you find the doctor is impatient when you ask for clarification, then perhaps you need to find another doctor. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how successful that doctor is, how popular, how much of an expert they are, uh, or how brilliant they are. Every patient should be treated as though she's the only patient in the waiting room. And if you have a doctor that isn't doing that, then maybe you need to find somebody else. And then I would just remind people, you know, health is a journey. Just because you might not have the physical body that you want today doesn't mean that you can't have it with the right amount of work but you need to be prepared to fix whatever is going wrong inside before you fix what's going wrong outside and part of that is also addressing i'm like i i always say to people and anyone comes to me for, for weight loss advice i always ask them one question why do you eat you don't eat because you're flawed or you're a bad person you don't eat because you have a willpower deficiency we need to figure out what's going on and that's why i always say to people if you don't heal the mind as well as the body you haven't done the job at all because you cannot divide one from the other Mm -hmm. absolutely you keep hearing you are what you eat and um you know it just goes back to how i struggled from a specific thing and it often is because of what i ate um and 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 thank you for sharing that you know um i think i I think a health health goes a long way um towards what did you put in your body um and it's something that i need to be more conscious of as well you know sometimes we're just so spur of the moment i want this let me eat that and then you live with the consequences later well bear in mind we live in an environment where we can literally click our fingers and get hold of the cheapest junk available that's the problem and this is a problem because you know busy people um people in a rush people under pressure people hungry are not going to make the right choices not because there's something wrong with them but because they're human yeah. And that is what fast food companies, um, processed food companies exploit. They don't just take advantage of it. They exploit it mercilessly. And, And that is a problem. Yeah, yeah. Thanks again, doctor, for your time, knowledge, and you just shared everything. You know, you just... I appreciate you not holding back and saying everything that's on your mind. I appreciate it so much. Oh, I held a lot back, believe me. Did you? This is, this is holding back? <laughs> okay. When can I come in for a consultation? I'd like to know more <laughs> off the record. Uh, honestly, thanks for coming on the show, doctor. I really hope, uh, I know, I trust that a lot of people will uh, see value in this episode and incorporate some learnings into their daily lives. And again, doc, thanks for taking time and coming on the show. Thank you for inviting me. Thanks, Habibi. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you.